Uh, I'm just going to talk in a kind of personal way in uh, how I used Gustav and his work as an inspiration. Um, where I was coming from was I get a, a mixture of places in the early 80s. Um, I'd been quite um, involved with the punk rock scene in London in the 70s and by the early 80s that wasn't really interesting me. So on the one hand I got interested in how one became an artist and formulated a project where I thought I'd try to become a recognised artist. Uh, and on the other hand I was involved in various left communist groups which is neither anarchism nor um, Trotskyism but uh, anti-Bolshevik communism. Uh, which viewed things as the Russian Revolution, for example, as capitalist and not communist. You can go and look up uh, Bordiger's analysis of the agricultural question in the Russian Revolution if that sort of thing interests you. It did me and still does. Um, so with trying to configure myself as an artist, I was also looking at the history of art. I didn't have an art school background, um, but what from maybe when I'd been 11 or 12 in my not very good school library there was a book on Dada, a book on futurism um, and for some reason the something else press um, book on uh, happenings. So that was a kind of area of art that interested me for a long time. So in, in the course of trying to configure myself as an artist and work out how to do that I started looking at things historically as well. Uh, so by the mid 80s I was going to places like the uh, the old Tate before you had the split between the Tate Modern and Tate Britain the old Tate uh, library to look at stuff in the British Library which I got a reader's ticket for um, and the kind of figures that it, at the same time I'd become immersed in the uh, mail art network the international mail art network which was a kind of uh, I assume people are familiar th with this, but artists in a non-commercial way exchanging works via the postal system. In some ways it was a paper net precursor to um, the internet. Uh, and I was looking for a kind of inspiration and a lot of the times when I did things, if I found someone had done what I was doing before me, I, I thought that was a confirmation that I was on the correct path with the work I was pursuing. Um, and some of the the Within the mail art network, Fluxus was a big thing, and within the kind of left communist groups I went to, the Situationists were a big thing for some people, but not for everyone, because people tend to forget that within left communism, there is on the one hand the kind of councilist uh, tendencies, which the Situationists are an example of, and on the other hand, the kind of Borgist, um tendency. So there's very much, I mean, that's a simplification, but there's definitely two poles to that, of which the Situationists sat very much on one. Uh, but there were people at the meetings I went to, things like London Workers Group, fascinated by the Situationists. Uh, but I realised that there was a more of an artistic angle to the Situationists than a lot of the p political people I, sp I spoke to realised and was looking that up. And in some ways, Mezca was a, a figure who fitted in quite well with, with the kind of things that I liked when I came across him. I don't remember when I first came across him. Um, so I was going and looking for information about Metzger uh, and I came across um, the Society into Art, Art into Society catalogue in 1985 which has a brief piece by Gustav where he was writing about um, having an art strike um, to overthrow the kind of dealer system where artists wouldn't make work or sell work and the idea was that the dealer system would collapse. I think you have to see that project in the context of, I think it was 1974 the catalogue was published, um, ICA catalogue, in the context of uh, politics at the time. So we were just having the oil crisis globally and we weren't aware that there was going to be a whole series of defeats for the workers' movement. So looking back on, back on it in retrospect, it might appear very utopian, but I think if you think yourself into the time of 1974, which I can just do, uh, in a lot of ways it was the, peri the period in which I became politicised and gravitated towards the left uh, because there were two elections in Britain with Heath asking the question who runs the country, me or the miners. The miners, uh, coal miners were striking a lot at the time um, and he failed to get re-elected, which the obvious answer was that the miners run the country. Unfortunately they didn't. 
Um, but I would walk to school through a sea of Labour posters, which was the opposition. Um, not, I wouldn't view them as particularly left-wing, but the left-wing opposition to his Conservative Party. Um, so that was the context. Now, I'd come across Metzger's um, autodestructive art and other manifestations. I'd never come across any reference to the art strike before this. I looked for more information about the art strike. I couldn't find any relating to Metzger's project. Um, I did find things like Alan Joffrey in an in a old book talking about May 68, a book tra I read it in an English translation, uh, talked about going on an active art strike from 68, a kind of productive art strike against the state, talk talking from the perspective of the May occupations movements in Paris. And I also came across an early 70s one-day art strike in New York, but nothing else um, relating to Gustav's art strike. But I really like the way um, Gustav formulated his art strike, which was uh, on a certain level rhetorically extreme, talking about putting artists in camps where their works could be um, <coughs> systematically destroyed if they, if they produced them. Um, I thought this would be an interesting idea, as a lot of my work over the years has been putting back into play things I've come across historically uh, to put back into play, but also to reconfigure, because I didn't think there was a realistic possibility in the mid-80s of getting gallery artists to go on strike. I mean, the London art scene at that time was very different to what it is now. It was a much smaller scene than it is now. And if you kind of got involved in the art scene, which I had by that time, you pretty much got to know everyone. So people Gustav had worked with, like John Latham, were around and readily accessible. Um, I loved the descriptions of Latham's work in uh, Dias, where, you know, the scoop towers, uh, which he got these huge old books and made towers of them and set fire to them, um, obviously without permission in the street. Um, Latham himself was showing at the Listen Gallery at the in the 80s, so I'd go to the openings and um, kind of wish that I could meet uh, Metzger instead of Latham because Latham mainly wanted to talk about, I mean it relates to Metzger, um, his fi uh, scientific theories where he'd, uh, prove, he'd go through, spend two hours talking to you and end up saying I therefore prove that um, the artist can do in three dimensions what the physicist can't do in 13 or 14. I forget which the exact number was. But basically, the science didn't make any sense at all to me. I don't claim to be a scientist, but I did have a grasp of a few basic scientific principles. Um, but Metzger was this figure who had disappeared, and you'd hear a rumor. Someone would, I'd see someone like Simon Anderson, who I'd met by at a talk at the ICA asking the questions at the end uh, would be, so what's he, if he was talking on fluxus, what's the relationship between the situations and fluxus? And he'd think, oh, there's a smart young man. So he befriended me. Um, and he'd report, or Andrew Wilson, who now works at the Tate, would report that Gustav had been seen briefly on the campus of the University of Sussex and had apparently been in Brighton for two days, um, but was kind of peripatetic around Europe. Uh, so he was this mysterious figure. And uh, there was another mysterious figure who later re-emerged, Ben Moraya from Black Mask Up Against the Wall Motherfucker in New York, who also very much interested me. But I just thought I'd put the art strike back, in, back into play. I, initially, I did a Xerox um, flyer with a proposal for an art strike. I think I just slightly reworded Gustav's original proposal. Um, and then I started putting out in underground magazines and various other places. Uh, the idea that there would be an art strike from 1990 to 1993 um, and elaborated this with other concepts about a refusal of creativity because I was working with notions of plagiarism and stuff at the time. Um, it didn't get much reaction for a long time and I don't remember now which happened first but uh, because I was circulating this one through um, kind of ultra-left left communist networks and two through the mail art network a group of artists connected to mail art although not all of them were mail artists some of the key people were and associated with artist television access in uh, craig baldwin's gallery in um, san francisco decided to form an art strike action committee and i thought that sounds like a good idea we better get one in london um, and then a few others formed one in baltimore on the east coast of the states and other places 
um, around the world. There was uh, allegedly one in Monte Montevideo in Uruguay, which I don't know anything about. Uh, and um, what we were able to do was uh, I could go to journalists in London and say, oh, look, we've got this art strike action committee in London, but it's all happening in San Francisco. And in San Francisco, they said, look, we've got this art strike action committee and it's all happening in London. So we were able to get a little bit of um, straightforward media coverage. I mean, that kind of led up to me being on like local London TV talking about it and um, in publications like The Melody Maker and normal press publications. But uh, around the same time, I haven't got visuals pre-prepared, but I can show you this. I also came up with this graphic um, for the art strike, which is uh, two hands holding a paintbrush, uh, which is broken. And that seemed to, it's almost like that corporate branding thing, that seemed to really galvanize people because it was just this image and graphic. I mean, again, that came out of just looking at other graphics. So there's quite well known um, CND, anti-nuclear uh, weapons graphic of two hands breaking a missile. So that was where I took the idea from. I just looked at it and thought, I'll put a paintbrush in the hands. Um, but that, that also seemed to help with, um, propagating the art strike and um, we you know th this book is edited by a guy called James Mannix uh, who was peripherally involved in the art strike action committee but to be honest um, we had three people in in our committee in London and we didn't do that much collectively we didn't discuss that much we just would do whatever we did so I organized I took all the posters which were sent to me from a um, Art Strike Action Committee event in Artist Television Access where they'd had a workshop and created posters and then I got them displayed in a place called Community Copy Art in King's Cross in London. So we just, mainly it was propaganda and what I was interested in I guess was a debate about what is art and I was looking at all sorts of uh, sources for what is art. One of the um, sources that made a lot of sense to me and strangely I discovered years later that the author was uh, had been a friend of my mother in the early 60s around the time I was born but I didn't know this when I was reading his book a guy called Roger Taylor wrote a book called Art and Enemy of the People um, and he was basically arguing that um, art was whatever those in positions of uh, cultural power said was art so you could tie this in as I did with Peter Berger's theory, theory of the avant-garde and uh, notion of the institution of art, the kind of things we were reading in the 80s in the art world. We were reading slightly different things when it came to political activism. Uh, so we were just messing around with a lot of this stuff and uh, it created a surprising amount of interest. I mean, the other thing, I, I read through this on the train last night or yesterday coming to Amsterdam and then to the Hague uh, that was is very noticeable to me now is it's very much a pre-internet project and one of the things people talk about in some of the stuff that was written about it was how I could drop these names that no one had heard of like Gustav Metzger uh, now if you wanted to know about Metzger if you heard the name you'd look him up on the web and a lot of the things would come to you quite easily so this research and material and debate went on in quite a different way from how it would today and I was very much struck by that looking at the material again. Um, the I actually wanted to stop work as an artist because I'd done this project starting in 1982 to make myself into an artist. Uh, when I declared the art strike I didn't know if it was going to be successful although I was involved in group shows uh, with various other artists who are now mostly forgotten. This is also how art history works. Don't name your collaborators and then you emerge as the uh, highest profile person out of those events. But um, I was sh uh, showing wi in places like Chisholm Gallery, which again, the history becomes very lopsided because now Chisholm Gallery is a much bigger deal than it was in the 80s when I showed there in 86 in a show called Ruins of Glamour, a group installation. Um, and at the same time, you had places like the ICA, which in the 80s had much more cachet than it has now, the Institute of Contemporary Arts. If you went and talked at the ICA, you would um, be on BBC Radio and possibly on the TV, uh, which is in fact what happened. So just before the art strike started, I got asked to go to the ICA and um, <coughs> 
talked about the art strike, which was a big deal, which then got me on national BBC radio and on local, local London TV. Um, and uh, I very much, because as I said, I, I, the show The Chisholm Hell had got newspaper coverage and got coverage in um, the art press. That was the first show I had that was widely reviewed, so I'd kind of legitimated myself as an artist by 1986, in my opinion, and completed the project, but I carried on until the art strike. Um, but when I declared the art strike, I wanted a definite end to what I was doing because I didn't want it to drag on forever in case it didn't work. Um, but quite quickly it did did work after I declared an art strike and then other people involved. It certainly wouldn't have got the attention it got if other people hadn't involved themselves. Um, but when I stopped for those three years, I just claimed unemployment benefit, although I'd actually been making a living from the cultural industry at the end of the 80s. and. You, I tried to be uncreative, which for me was to go back and look at the sources for a lot of the Marx and Marxist material I'd been reading, which meant reading through Hegel and Kant um, during the day, and then in the evening I'd watch Kung Fu movies. Um, so, and what's strange is I had a friend in the 80s, and to this day, an artist who was then known as Pete Horobin, who did a project called Data, and he was trying to um, break down the creative process by recording everything about his life from 1980 till 1990. Uh, he was a little bit older than I was. Um, and in some ways, you look at the, what he's recorded, and it's an incredible recording of a life. Um, but he literally records when he goes to the toilet, what time he gets up, what he has to eat, literally everything. Now, I was trying to be uncreative during the art strike, but I watched... Um, a lot of Kung Fu films and some of that in some way came back to bite my tail because uh, although I'd watched Kung Fu films as a child, uh, I hadn't particularly paid attention to Bruce exploitation, which is a subgenre where people riff on Bruce Lee after his, not always after his death, but often after his death. He was a huge international superstar in Southeast Asia from 1972 on, so there are rip-off Bruce Lee films from 72. He died in 73. And I ended up making a show at Glasgow International, um, at Queen's Park Railway yeah, uh, Club in 2016, uh, which was based around Bruce Brotation. So in some ways, although I was on the art strike, perhaps that fit into what I ended up doing a long time later. Um, I, when I finished the art strike, I kind of said my farewell at the ICA and the Victorian Albert Museum, which is a stuff, even stuff your institution who asked me to go and talk about it uh, when I started doing things again in 93. So I did. Um, I hadn't particularly intended to get back in, in the art world because I'd also had a career as a novelist in the 80s and that was what I was more focused on at that time. But Matthew Higgs um, was very insistent. Um, he now runs White Columns, uh, but he was trying to organise a counter to young British art in the in the mid-90s, I guess, and he really liked what I'd done in the 80s. He hadn't known me then, but he'd come across it, and he was very insistent I should show with him. So the first thing I showed after I came back, which I think was um, 94, I showed it with him, or 95, in City Racing, um, was the Art Strike bed, and I had this idea that I'd show the bed that I didn't really sleep on during the Art Strike, so every time I showed the bed, it would be a different bed. And in that show, um, he also had a new new showing of Gustav's cardboard boxes because by that time, Gustav had uh, cardboard works had really shown up in London. And as soon as he showed up, um, he wanted to get hold of me because I'd written this stuff about him in the 80s, a chapter in a book called The Assault on Culture that I did, uh, which was published in 88, uh, which was also about fluxes and situationists. Um, and I met with him in Neil's yard in Covent Garden the first time I met with him. Unfortunately, I got rid of my archive of things because I live in a council flat to the National Art Library in London in 99, so I can't go back and check dates without going to the National Art Library. Uh, but what I do recall about the first meeting with Gustav was that he obviously really liked the fact that I'd taken these ideas of his and worked with them and that I'd written this um, historical material about him. Uh, but he wanted to spend a long time going through the 60s work, talking about it, talking it about it in relation to people like Tangley and, and making very, very sure that I understood the chronology of everything, um, that I had it absolutely correct because Gustav had a, 
very strict chronology of when everything happened. I mean, as I got to know him later, things changed a lot, and he was always very generous about um, young artists and other artists' work and always wanted to talk about different artists' work. But that first meeting, which was maybe four or five hours, he just wanted to make sure I had down absolutely correctly every bit of chronology relating to his work in the 60s. Um, so that was one way in which things went on. I mean, with the art strike bed, Matthew Higgs re-showed it at the ICA and took the original bed because Paul Noble, who became a successful artist, I didn't want my bed back, and Paul Noble took it and slept on it because he didn't have a bed. And it wasn't supposed to be the same bed that was shown again, and then I've shown the bed in other places. I mean, Higgs gets lumbered with it because he did a mini retrospective of me in white columns in 2011 and again we showed an art strike bed but not the original because it was never meant to be the same one twice. Um, and I mean one of the other ways I'm just going to wrap up with in which I felt I kind of followed Gustav around, I don't, again I don't remember the date but I remember going to Gustav getting the Hamlin award which is the award that um, British artists really want uh, because it's basically twice the money of the Turner Prize. It's not the, uh, it's an insider recognition thing. So when Gustav got it, it must have been some time ago because it was £30,000 and um, not even that recently. In 2013, I got it by which time it was uh, £50,000. But I can remember thinking, oh, this is amazing, Gustav getting this thirty grand and going to the award ceremony, being very pleased for him. And it wasn't until I got the award uh, Jane Hamlin, who runs it now, um, you know, obviously the money originally comes from her father, uh, kind of took me aside and said, oh yes, we, l we loved all the work you did around Gustav and, Gustav and the things you, you did with Gustav and what you wrote about him. Um, and she told me that when you get this award, you have to be n uh, nominated and then you have to fill in a kind of complex form, but Gustav couldn't be bothered to fill in the form. So obviously someone else had done it for him because they were very keen to give uh, Gustav this money, not as, as they were obviously keener to give it to him than me because I had to fill in the uh, the forms to get the award myself, which are quite complex. Um, so that's, you know, the w I, I guess one of the things you see artists kind of following each other around and helping each other out and um, I don't know when I showed, say, with Gustav at T1 and 2, which was a squatted gallery in London in 2002, uh, whether he asked Wolf Lenkovics, who I also know, to put me in the show, or whether it was Wolf's idea, but I kind of found myself wandering around with Gustav um, artistically. And what I put in that show, there were three film works, I'll only mention one of them in 2002. I remade Guy Debord's Screams in Favour of Dessart because I wanted to think of the most pointless um, avant garde film to remake, according to the logic of Hollywood. So it was remade on the 50th anniversary. The original film is either white with sound or black with silence. The final 24 minutes is entirely silent. Um, I made it colour by using co TV colour bars rather than um, white, which was the logic of Hollywood to turn black and white into colour. And I also made it in English because obviously that's what Hollywood does when it does remakes. Um, so it seemed an, uh, an absurd and appropriate work to kind of show with Gustav. There were another couple of films that were along those lines. Um, but yeah, he was always very generous and about other people's work, but the, the one thing he never discussed with me was the art strike, he just didn't want to talk <laughs> about it. Um, but I was always pleased because other people would tell me that he referred to me as a very radical young man, uh, which was possibly a mixture of the politics and the kind of aesthetic approach to the work. Um, and he was quietly supportive um, always as well so you know just a, a great guy to be around and um, you know what also amazed me was that right up until his death um, if you went to the, some of the bigger openings in London I mean he, d he didn't make as much as he used to um, earlier on when he was back in London you'd always see him with two carrier bags full of who knows what uh, but later on he'd have his assistants uh, pushing him around in, in a wheelchair and you, if you went to a Tate opening, you were guaranteed to see Gustav any Tate opening that I would get invited to, Tate Modern or Tate Britain, he'd always be there. Um, so he was just a great guy who was always around and always had a good word for everyone.